O M me. Warning. Supernatural The Crossroads contains adult language and discussions. If you're easily offended, do not continue to listen. Oh, Dad. Oh, Dad. Oh, Dad. I'm in the And welcome to another episode of Supernatural The Crossroads. I am your host, Thomas Cowley, and joined with me today in studio is Michael Flores. Hey! And joined with us uh, in spirit, in thought, is Ryan Denton, because he is on a plane somewhere. Yeah. Being important or being a butthead. A wayward, lazy douche. There we go. Yeah. Is that our version of it? Yep. (laughs) That's our hashtag? (laughs) Yeah. A wayward, lazy douche. Maybe we can make a spinoff. I like that. I think Ryan should herald that. Should we have a spinoff of a spinoff? I can't speak. A spinoff of a spinoff? Yeah, I think we should have a spinoff of a spinoff, and Ryan can host that one. And it'll be just Wayward Lazy Douche. It'll be just the Claire show. So it'd be Wayward Sister. And all be, Claire all the time. It, it would be just an emphasis on Claire only. I think he's going to like that. I think I think it'll have a long and prosperous lifespan with just Ryan talking about Claire. Yeah, I think he's going to like it a lot. I think. Uh, so let's make that official right now. Right. Yeah. That's just what he's going to have to the do. The wayward now. sister edition. There we go. Guys, we are back from mid break through season 13. Hopefully everybody had a great holiday weekend. Now we're holiday talking weekend. Holiday weekend. Was it was there, on was, Sun. Was it on Sunday? Was there a holiday this past weekend? I don't remember, dude. It's all a blur. This is what happens when we don't do a show about, for like three how weeks. About holidays, Thomas. How, holidays. Hope everybody had a great holiday season. Now we're back and it's, we're getting ready to start our shitty lives back up. Right? Yeah. It's coming in full force and the sadness will ensue. But right now we've got Supernatural and we have the Wayward Sisters backdoor pilot Mm -hmm. we have been waiting quite some time for this this is the second attempt at a spinoff for supernatural since the ill-fated bloodlines of season nine and it has finally arrived and we have seen a lot of fan outpouring for this episode a lot of people have wanted this for quite some time for years we now finally have it and we've had ideas about a Supernatural spinoff since Bloodlines, even before that, when that was still being talked about and thrown about. We've had talks of whether it would involve the mental letters. Mm-hmm. Would it be just a Castiel story? Mm-hmm. Would it have the Thule, a.k.a. the Nazis, with Aaron and his golem? That would be cool. We talked about a Wild Wild West, uh, like the season six episode with the Phoenix yeah, and Samuel Colt. Right. Not like the one with uh, Will Smith. No, not like that. We don't talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the bloodlines level movie yeah wayward shit film yeah but we talked about actually having jody mills get a spin-off character since se- season nine yeah when we first really started doing this show yeah and i had forgotten that i love listeners when they go back and listen to our old library of shows and a listener tweeted out to us a few days ago and actually right before the premiere of the yeah, wayward the sisters before, backdoor pilot and they specifically said hey i'm listening to your interview right now for the first time with kim rhodes and even back then you guys were championing uh a spinoff with kim rhodes's character in it and i do remember what we've been an advocate for her getting a, a lot bigger role in supernatural in general not just a spinoff but even in the show itself we kept saying bring her in more bring her into the myth arc get her more involved in the show rather just than just doing those one-offs and what is this five years later one four years later yeah five years later she's leading a squad of uh kick-ass individuals in their own spinoff 
Potential. Potential spinoff. Potential spinoff. This was the backdoor pilot, but yeah. they have been hey. setting... Uh, they've been laying the seed for quite some time, all the way back to the beginning of this season, episode three, with Patience, introducing a new character. And unlike Bloodlines, the idea was that this is can stand on its own feet, but is not a completely separate entity. And that was a lot of the complaint about Bloodlines at the time was that it felt too distant. Right. That Sam and Dean were barely related to the story at all. It was like you had watched a completely different show. You came in partway through and you're like, what am I watching? This isn't the show I tune in for every week. So this setup has all kinds of new material, truthfully. It's got a wealth of information, whether it's new monsters, giant spoilers, giant gorilla, King Kong like beasts, universe right. hopping Thank villains. Thank you for specifying that. Cause it's not gorilla, it's gorilla. Because otherwise we'd have a bunch of people wielding you know, machetes and and, and fighting machine from guns. the bushes. <laughs> yeah, we just want to make attacking sure. our supply lines. Yeah, <laughs> that's what they do. What if that was the monster? That's what they do. They attack trains yeah. and shit. Gorillas. <laughs> Gur. Yeah, specify. What if when Dad was pitching this, he said, "Hey guys, we should have like a giant gorilla." And Adam for v, you know VFX Adam's like, "Okay, so you want a gorilla?" And he worked on this elaborate VFX army. Yeah, and. This whole time he thought it was gorillas. I'm like, no, Adam. King Kong, not Gor- Argentina. Gorilla. Gore. <laughs> you just wasted five fucking months. How much money would that cost? I, I made like five giant gorillas. <laughs> Terrible. That's your job, right? One job, Adam. <laughs> no, but we've got giant gorillas. We've got universe hopping villains who look like Kylo Ren. We've got explosions and fireworks and, and gunfights, hot chicks, hot dudes. Everything is in this, dude. There really is. And honestly, say what you want about the backdoor pilot. There has been some negativity, of course. There has. Like, like there is with Understandable. That's with everything. Right. But at least it had a lot of new lore. And that's, you know, yes. us being lore whores. The lore whores oh, that we lore are. Whore. That's good. Yeah. The lore whores that we are. <laughs> I think that was one of the most exciting elements. It's just, it was jam packed with not just old lore or repurposed lore, which is what a lot of spinoffs do in general. They repurpose things you already know. Retcon they, a few things here and there. Right. They're int- like Bloodlines did. Yeah. They retconned the hell out of things with some of their monsters they introduced. So this was very different. They, were, they weren't repurposing lore, they were including. New, new lore. They, ideas. Were, they opened up the world of supernatural. And I think from that aspect alone, this backdoor pilot is a success just based on that small little aspect. Well, and we've talked about how supernatural has had the ability to open up its universe time and time again. I mean, I'm thinking all the way back to Oz, that entire idea that fictional Oz and Dorothy from the book is a real character that they can bring into the world have it in a way that makes sense was the first not really the first but one of the major steps forward to me of the potential of this show yeah and this i think as we talked about excuse me i'm dying over here as we talked about at the mid-season finale a few months back that multiverse glimpse just a glimpse at what is possible what we know about behind the curtain thanks to billy becoming death Things like that have blown the doors wide open. And like a good pilot episode, this took some of that and ran with it. Yeah. Giving us so much more potential for new ideas to be brought to the table. And that should have been the focus of the backdoor pilot more than anything. And it was the focus on longevity on Mm -hmm. a series that can sustain numerous years. That's the point when you're releasing a backdoor pilot. You have to tell people and not just a backdoor pilot a pilot in general in general any show you have to be able to show them that this world is sustainable that there is so many different directions you can take the story uh in different avenues to where it's interesting well the worst thing would be like this is my tv show i have enough ideas for a year yeah it's very <laughs> i mean look what kripke did with his pilot yeah. i mean the the potential was there from the very beginning and i feel again if you want to compare these uh, it's hard to do that it's hard to do because the original pilot is just fantastic and i mean they do way. they do deliberately draw some parallels where yep sam and dean have been missed went on a hunt and they haven't called in in a few days you know yeah that exact line 
Yeah. It draws the comparison. But you're right. They took the right aspect and gave us a bunch of stuff that allows multiple years of storytelling to be had. And that needs to be the focus is do you have enough narrative? Do you have strong enough characters to tell a story over the course of years that will draw the audience that not only loves Supernatural but loves storytelling? Yeah. Because that's one of the things that I give a lot of praise to Supernatural fans. Yes, we're, you know, we have crusader-like favor when it comes to this show. Mm-hmm. But they actually like a strong narrative backbone. If things don't make sense, people say it. And yes, while the brothers and the acting can carry it at times, it has always needed that strong writing core. Yeah. Other shows we've talked about before have lacked that and have lost viewership dramatically. Right. In a fraction of the time. Yes. And that's why it's still on for 13 years. Absolutely. So we're going to talk about that. That's going to be the crux of it. And thankfully, we've had pretty minimal complaints about Wayward Sisters so far, which is a good sign, uh, especially with the internet these days being as negative as it constantly is. The most common complaint, it seemed to be, was about Claire. Now, yeah. Claire has always been a divisive character as far as the show goes, because there's a lot of people who truly love her character, truly love the actress and her abilities. And there's a lot of people that feel like she detracts from the show or she could be written better, more strongly in one way or another. And we've got a little bit of a mixed bag. I think when it came to wayward sisters in regards to Claire specifically, which we'll get into as we get into the actual discussion of the show. Yeah. Cause I know even in the chat room, I think people have not stopped bitching about Claire since they, <laughs> Uh, not I was, the, I was not, using more polite I, I'm dialogue. Not, I'm not going to say any names, but I mean, it, it just nonstop about right. Claire. Ryan's in the chat room? <laughs> yeah. What, what, Whatever he was from the plane, just to be a dick. We're going to give an honest discussion on this show, and we're going to get into all the different facets and avenues of this backdoor pilot, including the pros and cons. And some of those pros and cons do, in fact, include the character that uh, appears to be the lead. For Wayward Sisters, and that is Claire. Mm-hmm. And I think it's fair to say that this episode was not perfect by any means. It has strong potential as a pilot episode, right. but it also is just a pilot episode. Yeah. We cannot make a full judgment as to what its potential is from that. Uh, so before we get into all that, we're going to talk a little bit about ratings and news. Supernatural's Wayward Sister has already done well for improving the ratings of the show, according to comicbook.com. Saying on Thursday night, Supernatural aired its mid-season premiere, which also acted as a backdoor pilot for its spinoff series, Wayward Sisters. The episode featured leading characters Sam and Dean Winchester, but focused mostly on the group of female monster hunters that set out to free them from an evil dimension. Mm -hmm. Can a whole dimension be evil and possess allegiances? Uh, Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think they can. These are, you can do whatever you want. Is that how it goes? Yeah. If you're writing your own story, you can do whatever you want. And then the a whole evil dimension? Why not? I think that's cool. Just like some kind of Stygian pit of hell? And it, yeah. All right. You can sustain like five years just on an evil dimension for a TV show when you really think about it. They never need to cross to another universe ever again. That's true. Uh, they say the episode aptly titled Wayward Sisters brought some extra eyeballs to Supernatural's average Thursday audience, pulling in 1.87 million viewers total and earning a 0.6 rating In the 18-49 to demographic, the much-sought-after demo. With a solid performance in the introduction episode, Wayward Sisters looks to be a successful venture for the CW. Now, one episode, I I, I don't want to be negative, but I have a bit of an issue with an article saying, oh, it's a success, we're moving on. Because anybody who looks at those Nielsen ratings knows that those are kind of iffy these days. I like seeing a positive trend, but the episodes waver a lot Yeah, episode to episode. Yeah, and they're comparing it to the last number because when you really look – and yes, this is fine. They're trying to get out Articles, in, in front you know, for the PR. You know, They want this yeah, to get picked up. Yeah, makes sense. So I get that there's going to be articles like that. I get that they're going to um, you know, put those up. They're going to want to talk it up. Yeah, exactly. But if you look at the actual numbers, the numbers aren't necessarily anything that – much better than what we kind of see regularly. Yeah, because you have overall the six point four increase in viewership from the mid season finale. But the show prior 
was a 40% increase from the week before that. It's just the holiday season always drags the shows down in those ratings, on those yeah. same-day ratings. Again, these numbers don't include the uh, same day plus 3 and 7, but these do include the same day up until 3 a.m., I believe, of the same day that the episode aired. And, I mean, if you want to go by that, the biggest disparity was when Ep- Supernatural had an episode during Thanksgiving. Yeah. That that hurt its numbers dramatically, yeah. but it didn't truly affect the show. Yeah, so overall, the ratings really didn't go up that much. And I think... Today's day and age, we have to take into account people who watch via the app or through other means these days, as well as there was a huge push just to get it back on to Netflix or that the UK didn't have Supernatural for a little bit there. So you can't take it just by these numbers. But like you said, I understand wanting to get ahead of it, wanting to be in the PR limelight while it's a talked about episode right. and at least the ratings didn't go down because True. if the ratings were a disaster then that would be on a mid-season premiere that would be bad yeah that would be bad so the fact that the ratings did increase at least from the prior episode that is a positive however i am looking forward to seeing what those three day and seven day numbers end up being yeah because that's going to be the deciding factor honestly whether or not this gets picked up because you can't base it on the enthusiasm on social media because even on social media i i see a lot of people retweeting um the the twitter or the social media share nielsen ratings that new thing they've been Mm -hmm. doing for about four or five years now and that's amazing and that's fantastic and i think it's roughly four hundred thousand people throughout the um throughout the night were socially interactive i believe that's the the final number around four hundred thousand. that's a good number especially when you are number six out of 10 shows for a week not just that day for the week right that is a fantastic win but also at the same time a show's not going to necessarily get picked up based on twitter Nielsen they ratings. need more than that. Yeah, they, and that's the they simple need business. those three day and seven day numbers they need them that's the simple business aspect. Positive of word of mouth. Positive word of mouth needs to send people out of their lazy holiday slums and get back into the groove of watching <laughs> TV. But I want to Netflix and not go back to work. I want to Netflix and chill all alone with my dick. Wait, what? Yeah, please. <laughs> Isn't that just Hulu and Handjob? Hulu, yeah, all of them. <laughs> Amazon and anal. <laughs> YouTube and a reach around. <laughs> <laughs> that's when you know you've kind of hit the bottom of the barrel crackle and rusty trombone like there's all types of things you can do <laughs> crackle this still exists right jesus christ <laughs> oh my god no you're right they they need more numbers coming in but give it a few days we'll see and the fact that it's more ratings or our higher viewership than the mid-season finale and I want this to succeed. Positive. So I am positive word of mouth because I want this to succeed. I'm not going to want, I don't want this show to fail based on a backdoor pilot. There is so much more potential to this backdoor pilot than there ever was with bloodlines. Oh yeah. Give Night it, and day. Let's, let's see what, let's see what Kim Rhodes can do with her team. Let's do it. I agree. And like you said, there's so much more to talk about, which we've already started talking about through some of the additional stuff we do on Patreon. So guys, if you have not checked it out yet, head on over to patreon.com slash Rainman Digital. You can see all the stuff we do at any of the number of tiers. For example, supernatural related content alone. We are doing a 10 minute at the crossroads, which is just a 10 minute segment where we are going to be talking about. Do you want to say his name that you gave it? Wait, what? Adam. Do you want to say what his nickname is? Oh, now? yeah. Our, t- our 10 minutes at the crossroads this month is going to be titled Prison Biatch Adam. And we're going to talk about his potential return to Supernatural this year and what it means for the season moving forward and the life of the series. Right. And that's just for $1 a month. Then we also talk about, we do a regular Crossroads episode, Wayward Sisters edition, talking about what they have done with the characters so far. The first installment, I think we talked about. We've done a few now. we've, We've done a few. I remember we talked about Jody and her background. Her as a the character origin story all the of, way from season five, yeah. how they wrote her origin story and got her prepared as a character before Wayward Sisters premiered. Mm-hmm. Then we also have the $10 video cast tier where we do additional Crossroads episodes going all the way back to season one, as well as we are going to be doing a season 13 first half recap and analysis as to where the story has gone. We're doing that tonight. That's tonight. 
That's tonight. After this show, if you sign up My for the God. for the $15 tier, you do live video of our recording sessions now. We do do not have the crotch cams installed yet. That's still being worked on and and we have a bit of a legal issue with that thanks to Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> and also the social climate is just not the right. Right, it's, not, it's just not it's just not the right timing. It's not what people want. Not right timing. So but guys, all of that stuff and more, a ton of additional content, ton of additional shows and, and maybe crotch cams at some point. Head on over to patreon.com slash Rainman Digital. We're going to take a quick break. And when we get back, we're going to be talking about season 13, episode 10, Wayward Sisters. Am I brave enough? Am I strong enough to follow the desire that burns from within? To push away my fear, to stand to where I'm afraid. I am through with this. The Rain Man Show. The Rain Man Show. I've never had that issue. Andrew, you're also autistic. Sure. And you don't know how to and, read human behavior. Yeah. It's That's, true. No, I understand. So that. you probably but think, I've never, oh, gosh, golly, this guy really liked me. Meanwhile, he wants to curb stomp I've you on your way out. I've never had that interaction. Everybody, it, I, it's because mostly, they don't know your schedule. Once they know your schedule, you're going to get curb stomped. <laughs> <laughs> it's every other day for three days, and then it's a two day rest. All right. But I've oh, never had that interaction. Like, wh- whenever I approach somebody and I say, hey, here's some resources that might give you a better resource. You. <laughs> what do you give them? Like a, what do you like? Let me pull up my bodybuilding.com <laughs> account. I'll like, show it to you, bro. You're offering books? Do you like, do you, do you pin like a link to Pinterest and you like send it over to them? No, I'm just like, hey, here's some, if you're looking for a routine or not uh, routine, if you're looking to fix your, or work hey buddy, on your I, form. I've actually, I've actually uh, pinned a few uh, great workout routines on, on my Pinterest. Hit me up. He goes over to the guy that's like fucking 260, 6'5", just ripped. Like, uh, hey, would uh, you like to try my routine? Yeah. You know when you squat, you got to break parallel, right? Uh, I'm like, hey, try, I'm like, hey, bro, with me. <laughs> I'm oh, oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, you're not helping anybody at the gym. Oh uh, man, I made some good friends. All right, I That's mean, all you, I'm saying about you, it. You, treadmill. He's got you, treadmill. You, friends. like, if I didn't know any better, I would think we were in 1930s and you were living in an attic with Anne Frank recently. That's how thin you are. You're malnutrition. <laughs> You're trying to get. <laughs> oh my god, I'm crying! Stop! <laughs> For more Rain Man, visit RainManShow.com. Holodeck 3 program is reinstated. Open Sesame! So different. And, yeah. and it, would, it wouldn't just fix the obvious issue with that Star Trek fans have right now with Discovery, because they do look very different. But let's not point our fingers at Discovery writers and say shame on them for fucking up the, the Klingons because the Klingons have always changed. The, oh, mo- the movies have changed them drastically from movie to movie. Next Generation with the introduction of Worf changed the Klingons and the way they looked again. So let's not point dis- at Discovery and blame them. Let's point to them and say they're our hope. There are hope to fix this issue, this this blinding fuck up that Star Trek has always done with yeah. the Klingons. They just threw they they were pissing in the wind every time they decide they want to use Klingons. <laughs> we don't care if the the peak blows back on the audience. Who gives a fuck? <laughs> They'll like it. Yes. <laughs> Open your mouths up. <laughs> Star Trek from the Hollow Deck, the Discovery Edition. Breaking down, analyzing, and discussing every episode of the new hit Trek series on iTunes and Stitcher. Simply search From the Holodeck. You can also find it on the Rain Man Digital app. Just search Rain Man Digital from the iTunes App Store or Google Play. Have you ever wanted something so bad that you do just about anything for it? Well, that's exactly how we feel about you. That's right. AdamandEve.com wants you so bad. We're giving you 10 free gifts with your first order. You heard me right. That's 10 free gifts to spice up your love life. First, you'll get a sexy surprise for her. Second, an adventurous toy for him. And third, a little something we know you'll both enjoy. Plus, you'll get six full-length adult movies on DVD. And number 10, free shipping on your entire order. That's 10 free gifts for you shy types. 
who've never tried Adam and Eve before. Just go to adamandeve.com and select any one item. It could be an adventurous new toy, a sexy piece of lingerie, or anything you desire. Just enter offer code DEAL30 at checkout and you'll get all 10 free gifts, including free shipping. That's offer code DEAL30. That's D-E-A-L-30 at adamandeve.com. Previously on Supernatural The Crossroads. Because they made that network. So they're, they are owed, I should say, that. Yeah. Plus, Sam and Dean still are incredibly attractive men. Yeah. I mean, those abs appeal to any demo. Yeah. But <laughs> damn, I'm damn. 16 and I like those abs. I'm 25 and I like those abs. I'm 32. I don't know how a 32 year old. You're 62 with that voice. <laughs> I was, dude. I was you playing the like internet. A, are you a, are you mining for gold too? <laughs> I was playing the oh, internet. I'm, like I'm 32. I was catfishing. <laughs> That was that was me typing. I'm 62, but I'm 32 on the internet. Oh, okay. <laughs> I like how you would explain that. It's, no, no, trust me, I'm not a minor. Yeah, from the 1840s. Wee doggies, I'm give me just some a gold. catfisher instead. Yeah. That's better. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> anyway, back to the characters. Not the one in the room here. Haya chooses to help Jack. And Sam and Dean. Well, does she really choose to? I mean, you put a gun to someone's head. <laughs> Get in the car. But yeah. after I'm that point, it was after that point. Shoot you in the face, I'm bitch. I'm go- oh, God. And the thing is, if you notice, <laughs> she well, wasn't. Do our mouths get like? That's what Dean did. Uh, he did yeah, get he- angry. He gritted his teeth. He got so gangster, dude. I was waiting for her to turn the gun sideways. I'm gonna shoot sideways. you in the face, motherfucker! I, I told you, you didn't uh, your ass see in that you to car. get in that car, motherfucker. All right, Dean got black there for a second. Oh my god! Anyway, Jesus, right? <laughs> Sorry, apocalypse. That's like another world. <laughs> All the characters dude, are black. That was amazing, <laughs> dude. Black sand. The Django world. Yeah, that'd be cool. Django world. That'd be amazing, dude. I would watch it. That's, no, dude, that's like, on BET. Hey, it's like Black Panther Super for Natural. Marvel. Like, um, why BET. can't we do that? Supernatural on BET. I'd like to see that An entire black cast of hunters. They, but the Impala has twenty twos on it. Dude, that'd be sweet. Oh my god! All right, <laughs> dude, you, you two so... need to write that later. <laughs> the Friday version of Supernatural. Oh my <laughs> god! Dude, that'd be amazing. Oh my god! You got knocked the fuck out. <laughs> He's talking to a Wendy Mickey Mouse. Is there apparently? <laughs> dude, that's oh boy. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> And a horn from a car? <laughs> I don't even know what the fuck that was. Thomas is getting annoyed, isn't he? Yes, he I is. I can tell. So yep. Hold on. Let me kill us with an ego, and then we get back to the show. What? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Oh, that's All right, that was good. Yep, that was good. fucking uh, good. That's right. All right, moving forward. Yes, she did. Welcome back, everybody. Supernatural the Crossroads. Now we're going to be talking about Season 13, Episode 10, Wayward Sisters. Ooh. With Sam and Dean trapped in the bad place, mm-hmm. Jody enlists Donna, Patience, Alex, Kaya, and Claire help rescue the Winchesters. Written by Robert Barnes and Andrew Dabb and directed by Phil Segrecia. Can I go to change.org and petition to change that name from the bad place? Dude, like the naughty zone the, or, or something the no go hole oh <laughs> <laughs> the glory hole place like the something. glory hole place. something how is that better i don't know the bad place just sounds so childish and and maybe it's it was kind of i think intended to because because it's, of her it's Kaya. haunted her life for so long yes as a kid that's what you would call it but eventually we need to change the name to something else yeah the like, no go hole erogenous zone i don't something the I'm down if you're down place. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That because we don't get any less childish on this show. Now, this episode followed directly after the mid season premiere. There was no time jump or anything like that. And it was written, directed by the same group of people. Robert Barons has been the keystone element to the Wayward Sisters show the spinoff he's written the patience episode he wrote the bad place mid-season finale yeah and the mid-season premiere with the help of andrew dab and it has been i i think regardless of whether or not you like the episode it is impossible to say that it was not seamlessly done yeah his ability to execute parallel narrative structure is unrivaled 
when it comes to Supernatural. I, I'm not trying to be mean to anybody, any other writers on the show, but he has always done fantastic with that setup. We've always said that. For years we've said that. that yeah. he, when you look at this type of writing style and when you want to progress a story along in, in, a, in a timely manner and cover a lot of ground, put Barons on the case because he will do it right. He knows how to write those parallel structures. Absolutely. He's done a great job with it. And it's not only – the thing I like about this episode is that it's not only strong as a mid-season premiere due to the content that we saw moving the story along, getting these characters out of the situation they're in and setting us up for more down the road. But it's also pretty damn good as a pilot episode to get us into these characters' heads, give us an idea of who they are and what their goals are. And this is something that and, – and and change a few things that even I had gripes about way back earlier in the season as far as it comes to Patience and some of the other characters. Right. All in one single episode. And traditionally with pilot episodes, you don't get to have a clear idea of what the world is or what the stakes are. And I think that's something that the original pilot from Kripke is so strong in and that we've talked about at length is that it did a great job not only setting up the world, setting up the tone – and giving us an entire wealth of opportunities, but it set up its characters very well and gave us a glimpse at what is possible. This didn't have to do that as much due to being part of a show that's already been established, and the fact that it had the breadcrumbs laid throughout season 13 to, to help aid in its efforts. So I think that worked very well in its favor, especially when you compare it to its first to the first iteration of iteration of a spinoff. Attempt. Yeah, they have number one. They included characters that we've already known for quite some time. Jody Mills, a uh, fan favorite, beloved by this show. <laughs> Sheriff Donna, Alex, Claire. They're utilizing characters that, for the most part, we already know. We get, we understand, and they don't have to spend a lot of time truly developing them because, honestly, there wasn't a lot of character development on them, and that I don't no, think that was wasn't. the point. The point was for us to get into the thick of it and understand the gravity of the current situation and the what-ifs, and that's exactly what this pilot did. It opened that doorway, gave us a cliffhanger into what is right around the bend for the Wayward Sisters bunch. Um, and I feel like the decisions leading up to this pilot and is what ultimately made it, I feel like, a successful backdoor pilot because they decide to include certain elements throughout the season. They didn't need to waste the 47 short the minutes time, yeah. you get to do a, an episode of TV, including the commercials and whatnot. And they can just get into the actual thick of of it all and get the story going and moving forward and I, I know there have been some people that have complained saying why do you have to intermingle and distract with the introduction of the wayward sisters by giving us an episode with patience and kaya and and jody mills and all these things and you're just kind of distracting from the main story but i would disagree with that because they're they haven't been distracting even the episode with patience being introduced yes patience was a big part of it but it was no different than any other monster of the week episode they utilized right. a monster of the week episode and introduce one of your key players that would eventually be in this backdoor pilot and because they did that you understood this character for the most part you understand her background uh, obviously we don't know everything we need to know however the way they're doing it is not in a distractor distracting manner no and i think kaya even more than patience fit in perfectly with the main arc of supernatural because of her abilities her connection to the bad place and the ability yes. for jack to use her as a conduit to travel to these other worlds to give us a glimpse at the possibilities and to also back up death's comment of the, this is a house of cards that you cannot be fucking with. That's the beautiful thing about Kaya's character she works great. is that she is the most seamless of the new characters. Absolutely. I mean, she's even more seamless than someone like Claire. And I'm not, again, not, this is not a Claire bashing moment, but I think she's even more seamless than her. There is an, a point, a definable oh, discernible discernible point for kaya's purpose yes and it can be used in the pilot it can be used in the future way where sister episodes and it was used in our main myth arc for supernatural and in a non-distracting manner it, it actually helped explain things get the moving pieces they need into place for the rest of the season right 
it, I think the two episodes did a very good job of a part one, part two setup. And that while we had the break in between, if you watch them, you know, if you're binge watching this a year from now, it's going to be seamless. It'll feel like it's just the next part of this, how things continued after the fact. And the strong thing about this is it's set up. It continued the main story. So we get to see how Kaya's powers led into this. We get to see a new monster, a new threat introduced. As I said, we get a glimpse at what death was saying about how, how careful we have to be with the rips in reality. And it gives us an opportunity to find their mom because there is another rift. There's a couple of rifts. If you know, spoiler alert, if the Kylo Ren version of Kaya came through a rift, that meant that existing one was from the bad place to our earth. Meaning there's at least three rifts then. So who knows how many more that also opens up possibilities for new villains, new opportunities, new monsters. It can really help propel the world of supernatural as a whole and not just supernatural, but it's a good setup for the pilot of wayward sisters. You know, Jody Mills at the end of the episode tells Dean you guys saved the world. We can handle Sioux Falls. But if you have this many riffs in reality, that may be a tall order. More than you expect. Everything works together. And yes. I think, and I feel like that was the one of the biggest things I was looking at with this backdoor pilot opposed to what we got with Bloodlines. Bloodlines felt like was something. Was a pothole in the road. Yeah, it didn't feel relevant to the world of Supernatural. It wrecked our momentum. It wrecked our car. We have this asshole charging us for an axle, which it's not bent, but he says it is. But fuck him. We don't know. <laughs> yeah. And it, then all of a sudden his name's Enos. So fuck him again. Oh, oh. And then we leave and we never find out nor give a fuck yeah. about the events. Yeah. And I, and yeah, we, but this, we can go on and on about the mistakes of bloodlines, yeah. but, but this is why I feel like the way dab and the crew chose to hide or weave these moments, these wayward sister I'd say moments. Weave, Cause it is throughout. It's yeah. well thought out. I think what they've done by weaving these moments within the story of season 13, it creates relevance to not just wayward sisters, but also supernatural as a whole. Absolutely. Ultimately, I feel like this was the way to go to introduce a, a backdoor pilot. And one, as we said, with the fact that you have all these rifts into reality, to me, as a supernatural fan, and as a you know, like to think of myself as some writing ability, it excites me due to how much potential there is. We know there's multiple rifts, so who knows how many different monsters could come from that? And that's one of the things that I'm looking forward to the most, which we saw with the. Uh, you know, they, they they have a pseudo name right now, uh, the Canids, which was the new villain, the new monsters we saw. Yeah. I just thought of them as Ninja Predator because that's what they look like yeah. <laughs> to me. But the idea that those are now out and about in the world and that other people haven't seen them, we don't know much about them. They have a completely different appearance is is exciting. The fact that we have so many other opportunities with these rifts in Sioux Falls and across the world, who knows, is yeah. exciting. That might be my favorite moment, honestly, the new monsters that were introduced. That might be my favorite part in the entire backdoor pilot because we always talk about the artistic merits of the first few seasons of Supernatural. And mm -hmm. it's the reason why the show has had such longevity is because of the academic and technical achievements of the first several years. Especially when you look at those first couple of episodes. You were drawn in. You know, under Kripke's rule, there was a lot of those out-of-the-box film techniques, utilized theories, concepts that... Unorthodox uh, and never tried before. Yeah, that a lot of people were not utilizing on standard television as much yes. as... Film. It's, it's more of a cinema thing that you would see in the, in the movies, in the feature films. And... I mean, there was just a lot of cinematic qualities about Kripke's era. And again, this is before the true golden age of television where they took these people who had worked on film, people who had been in the industry for years and said, let's do something creative, different and use every tool at our disposal, despite being a television show. Let's not be hampered by that preconceived notion that it has to be a certain way. And to see those techniques like the ones that were used to create the unnamed inhabitants or the the, the canids, as we're calling them, right? Of Currently. The of the bad place 
was something that they absolutely needed to do, and they did it fantastically. These are the types of technical and artistic achievements that define Supernatural. And for them to carefully utilize the Tom Savini-style makeup effects is just a testament to them wanting to really succeed with this pilot. They were willing to do some of those old school practical makeup effects that really sticks out. And you remember, I mean, for us oh, film yeah. geeks and movie nerds and Fangoria, you know, addicts, this was a must. And that is something that was on my list that I wanted to see. I, I was been, ecstatic. We've been talking about it nonstop on our Patreon Wayward Sisters edition. On our Patreon way back episodes all the way to season one. We discussed, like, will this pilot, will the new era of Supernatural introduce some of those cinema quality, old school techniques, the things that that created, that, that actually caused us to gravitate to the, the Supernatural in the, in the first place. And I was so satisfied to see them utilizing those old school techniques. Especially when I look back at season 12, when Dab was talking about wanting to take things from the original run, the old days of Supernatural, and reintroduce them. Now, while a lot of that ended up being story elements that he would capstone off and move away from, it's nice to see some of that practical effect, practical makeup brought to the world because it makes it feel so much more real in this episode alone you have werewolves something that has been established for quite some time right which is essentially cgi eyes and some teeth you know that have been done versus these new canids or ninja predators or whatever you want to call them until they have an official canon name they look completely different and the way they move the way they look the way the sounds they make everything about them feels so much more real than so many other things monster wise we've had even things i like yeah like the uh i cannot remember the name of the the little green bugs that gave people the green eyes and they used them to breed you remember that no i the, don't what episode the chitters oh yeah the chitters yeah, yeah yeah i can't remember the exact name of those creatures but that was essentially an eye color and a glowing stomach and they fucked a lot Right. A lot of fucking. Is that really a bad side effect? Well, that was in the bad place. Oh. That's the real bad place. Yeah. But with that, I like that a concept, but there wasn't much to see with that. How about the naughty place? <laughs> Touch me in the naughty place and give me the chitters. Oh, is that a side effect now? STD. <laughs> it's actually Symptoms in, are it's green actually eyes. in Super Wiki. It's, a, it's, it's canon. <laughs> the chitters STD. Now, but with these creatures, the canids whatever we end up calling them ultimately they feel so much more real so much more threatening as a result because it's real garb it's real makeup it's it's real you know the blood oozing that's blue from their mandibles that look like something out of the fucking predator movies yeah it makes it feel more threatening to me because it's from a different place and it separates itself from the monsters we've grown accustomed to because there's so much more of a physical threat to your person. They smash through windows. They ransack your stuff. They can hunt you across miles and miles. It, it's it's interesting material there. Now, Thomas. Yes. You and are you and I are both horror fans for the most part. We kind of gravitate agree. to psychological horror for the most part. Yeah. However, I think we have enough room in our hearts for a wide variety of horror. And I correct me if I'm wrong, both of us are sci-fi horror fans as well. We love those old school science fiction horror films like Aliens, oh, like yeah. Predator. Now, we've been talking about this, and we also discussed this in our Waywards edition on Patreon. What is going to be the genre of Wayward Sisters? Is this a potential clue as to what actually might be the genre that will be used as the as the spine or the platform to kind of keep everything tight? Your your series, your narrative. Will this actually branch into more than just the paranormal? Will it branch into sci-fi horror? You know, I hadn't thought of it at first because I was so just in the moment of seeing these creatures from the bad place. But I honestly think that would be a great move because with the opportunity of different universes, different realities, you have no limits. And for the fact that these things look so much like the Predator – the fact that there there's an obvious inspiration there's obvious inspiration yeah. from where it came from and the fact that you have a little it feels a little bit of a lighter tone if the tone of this episode is what we're trying to move into moving forward 
with Wayward Sisters, it's much lighter than the original Kripke run of Supernatural. And just from a camera lighting aspects like that, it has the potential to give us new material. And I think science fiction horror is something that has been completely untapped by Supernatural. We've right. only, we've had body horror. We've had traditional folklore. We've had, you know, monsters that go bump in the night. Things like that. And I'm, I'm not saying, when I say science fiction horror, I'm not saying I want aliens to start being the, no. the monster of the week. I'm simply saying using sci-fi horror as your source of inspiration and make it work in the world of supernatural. That would be fucking cool, dude. If you have alternate realities and limitless possibilities, they don't have to necessarily be true aliens in a flying saucer or anything like that yeah. to still take some of those notes as inspiration, whether it's character, body, build, how they interact, different languages, other things that may present new problems to them that they, as hunters, cannot go to anybody else for help. There's no going to anyone else about how do you fight these canids. That is now their realm of expertise. I think science fiction inspiration would be a great move. And give us something uniquely different that would be genuinely unique to this show. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't see why you wouldn't. And they looked fucking cool, dude. Like just the nerdy fan part. They looked fucking cool. Even before, you know, Alex did a scully maneuver and started, you know, <laughs> performing <laughs> surgery on it, which I love that as I well. Did. Yeah. Uh, just the way they looked as they're walking about with the red, the eyes. red eyes through the darkness, yeah. shuffling and moving. Such great work on the wardrobe and the costume. I mean, my hat is off. To the makeup special makeup makeup effects all the people that work to kind of bring that look together yeah and I, I think the name of the makeup artist i'm not sure and you know anybody who listens who's on the show yeah. whether it be barons or adam leanne ray podvin if that's not the individual who did this work please correct us because i want to reach out i want to interview her yeah this is the type of interview awesome. i want I want to talk exactly. about the inspiration and what she did and how she got to here. How long did it take to come up with that unique style for a villain? Where did you get the inspirations? Not just from a look, but a sound design movement. You have to create something completely new. Yeah, because I know the concept art originally was, uh, I want to say, from the production coordinator, Mary Matchin. Mm-hmm. I, I apologize if I mispronounce the name. I believe that's the original person who had the who put together the concept art. But looking at the concept art that was posted, the end result is very different. Right. It's similar, but it is it is noticeably different. So it would be interesting to find out what the inspiration truly was, and and what what it, is she a Tom Savini fan? Did she go through the old archives of his work? And if you guys don't know who Tom Savini is, Google the guy. As soon as you Google him, you'll know who he is. The guy is a a wizard, an absolute wizard when it comes to – he's the godfather in many ways of these types of special makeup effects. He's the classic horror guy from the 70s and 80s that made all those gruesome things. From Dusk Till Dawn, Dawn of the Dead, Creep yeah, Show, just, things like that. He is a sheer talent, that guy. Just sheer talent. And he was Sex Machine. Yeah, and going from dust till dawn. Yeah, he's not an actor all the time, but he's uh, right. managed to slip himself into into characters when he's done work on the movie. Now you said you talked about the fact that the concept art seems to have changed dramatically between mm -hmm. what they were initially perceiving to be these villains and what they ended up being on screen, and apparently that's kind of what affected the name as well. Because according to uh, Super Wiki, the script had these monsters known as Canids. But due to the evolution of the creature design from concept to creation, Robert Barons felt that the name no longer fit. Thus, the creatures currently remain nameless as far as the canon is concerned. Yeah. We don't have an actual name yet, so that could change. Which I'm really interested by this because I don't, I mean, I, I, I don't know specifically, but I, I haven't heard many times when it a monster went through such a dramatic change between concept and screen. Yeah. So that another thing that makes them unique and again, kudos to everybody involved in designing these things, it's making them come to life. Because I truly did get creeped out when Donna, Patience, and Alex have guns and they're in the hallway and they're waiting and they see one more coming. But then the I was Legion, turned on. What are you talking about? <laughs> you were turned on. I was like, please, all the you ladies, of death. all you ladies, point guns at me, please. You, you got issues, man. <laughs> can, uh, Patience, can you step on my throat as well, please? Oh, execution yeah, style. Step on my throat, then point that gun right at my head. 
Who hurt you, Mike? <laughs> Somebody at the bad place. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where the name comes from. Yeah. No, but when all of the the cannons were walking through the hallway and leaping over the cars towards them, yeah. they're about to be overrun. Yeah, it was cool. I loved that shot. Yeah. It looked phenomenal. And again, that wasn't even the like main big thing that happened in this episode as far as special effects were it was concerned. Si- it, was, it was small stuff, side stuff. Right. And that's uh, the amount of thought that went into just the side stuff is just fantastic. Cool. You know, and again, the spoiler alert, but the big thing was the kaiju, you know, King Kong. Who? Kaiju. Racist. Which is a Japanese word for strange beast, which is probably, I think, popularized between not only Godzilla, but Pacific Rim. Godzilla. The kaiju King Kong gorilla monster Mm -hmm. that we finally see. Gore. Gore. Gorilla. Not gorilla. Come on, Adam. (laughs) Gorilla monster that we finally see at the end of the episode, which I, I got such a vibe from Godzilla, from Cloverfield, whether I like that movie or not. When I when they pan the camera up and you just see the red eyes and the silhouette and you can kind of make out what that monster is above the night sky, that was just phenomenal. So kudos to Adam and the visual effects team. That was some amazing visual display and ballsy, I must say, because Fucking if ballsy, can dude. you imagine the faces? When first off, these I have lots of friends who are VFX guys and they love challenges. They're like, hell yeah, motherfucker, give me something to do. <laughs> But at the same time, if I was leading that band of rebels, I would be a bit intimidated as well. Oh, no shit. I'm like, okay, you want us to do a fucking gorilla? Like King fucking Kong. All right. How are we going to do this? How is it going to work? How is it not going to be cheesy? How are we going to make sure and execute this properly so that people don't laugh at it? And they pulled it off. How does it not break the canon as far as people are concerned? They did a great job with the fact that they kept it in the distance. They didn't make it a big part. Yes, it was throughout the the threat was we were kind of baited throughout the episode. Mm -hmm. And then just those red eyes first floating in the sky. Works so well. And then slowly you see the shape of the gorilla getting closer and then they're gone. It, It was just such a great moment. It reminded me of these old those old episodes of Quantum Leap. Where Dr. Sam Beckett is about to uh, get killed or he's uh, being chased by an ultra villain. And right at the last minute, he finishes his job and he leaps out of that body and goes to the next oh, job. Yeah. It was so cool. I-, I just love the entire vibe around that. But again, ballsy. Because if I was reading this on paper, if if this script would have leaked. Are you out of your fucking mind? You want yeah. to do what? <laughs> hey, Adam! <laughs> I want you to make a fucking gorilla. What? Uh, Dab, I thought we weren't trying to do bloodlines again. <laughs> and now you want me to make a, a 40 foot fucking gorilla? Is that in the script? Uh, Barons, when are you going to take over? <laughs> but my point is, is that if that would have leaked, if this script would have leaked, he would have made fun of it. I would have laughed. I'm like, no. Yeah. But they pulled it off. Yeah. I loved it. I thought it was awesome. I thought they did a very good job. with. I feel like ultimately the rendering and the texturing, the depth, it all looked good. It looked great. It looked better than some movies I've seen in the last few years. Yeah. And honestly, I feel like this is one of those those scenes that will be remembered as one of their better visual effects. And I'm, again, not bashing the visual effects, but like the Banshee. We always go to the Banshee. The Banshee is one of my favorite VFX jobs in contemporary Supernatural within the last several years. Yeah. Just one of the best. It's so crisp. Terrifying looking. It's scary. And I feel like this is going to go right up there now. It's such a great job. Yeah. And I mean, from for a long time, Supernatural has been giving all of us beautiful displays from imagery, from lighting, from special effects, from the monsters. I mean, even the details that some people don't probably aren't privy to, such as color grading and palette swapping for different places to invoke different moods. I mean, when you look at the gradient between the bad place to the neutral, that is our earth. Mm -hmm. And then the washed out low contrast of, uh, you know, apocalypse world. Everybody has always brought their A game. And when I think about what they've done 
visuals and opening up possibilities from the finale from season 12 to where we are right now. I mean, in those few episodes, was that 11 episodes? It's essentially been as much as we've had in the last 10 years. That's unprecedented. And, and you know, my hat is off to you guys for putting that together and having that much dedication for these years. Yeah. It looks, it looks phenomenal. I'm excited. Yeah. And these, these are the takeaways that I'm talking about when we're talking about this backdoor pilot. There's so much potential that that is why I'm excited moving forward because of what they delivered and the amount of effort that they put into the little things of this episode. Yeah. And we haven't even got into the characters yet. We haven't even talked about the story yeah. yet of this episode. We've just been purely talking about visuals and monsters and new ideas. So if you guys are interested, we talk, we're talk. we going to be talking a lot more about Wayward Sisters as well as we've gone into specific things about lighting and some of what we mentioned with Kripke's original run of the ideas from a cinematography standpoint that they brought into television. Head on over to patreon.com slash Digital, And if you pledge $10 or more, you get access to all of those additional episodes, plus additional shows, including Star Trek, uh, Comic Book Chaos, and all kinds of other little content about Supernatural that we put out there every month. So if you guys are interested on in that, head on over to patreon.com slash Digital. Just 10 bucks a month and you guys will get all that additional episodes. Yeah, and we have a complete season 13 first half breakdown coming out this week yeah. where we're going to take each episode one by one, break it down. We're going to talk about the strengths, the weaknesses, uh, writing, uh, pros and cons, and what it means moving forward into this. The continuing moving forward into season 13, episode 11, and the rest of the season. There's a lot to break down. And now that we have a kind of a snapshot of what's going to be happening and and kind of what they're aiming to do, I feel like there's a lot to discuss and really get into the nitty gritty. And that's what we're going to be doing on the newest video cast that will be out this week. And if you want to listen to it live, that'll be available to $15 pledgers for Patreon uh, right after this show. Go. Yeah. So I think with that, it's time we start talking about the actual meat of this episode, the narrative, the story, and the characters, and the things to come yeah. that we've got from this episode. So one thing that we didn't get a lot of within this episode was actual development on the individual characters that have been in the show. Now, some of that can kind of get away with, you know, Jody Mills and Sheriff Donna we've known for years. We don't necessarily need them to explain everything to us. We know who these characters are, and as we talked about in our Patreon episode— Jody Mills has been set up for years and an entire origin story moving forward into Wayward Sisters. But in this episode, Dab and Baron seem a little bit less focused on developing the individuals and more in developing their roles within the sisterhood, I guess, or the house and their perspectives from which the narrative will move forward. Now, the the fact that you have, what is it, six major characters in a 45, 42 minute episode. Right. Holy shit. That's quite a chore. First of all, and they, they tackle it the only way they could, which is moving the, them into place, giving you roles and responsibilities for each one of these characters without giving you too much about who they are more than what you need. Just little kernels of information. Yeah. about them. You, you, you were spot on at the beginning. You're right. It's a, it's about, understanding the roles they're going to be playing within this series moving forward. Because for the most part, as we were saying earlier, we, we already know the arc of Jody. We already know Donna and where she came yeah. from. We already know these things. And, and I feel like they had to focus on the development of the roles themselves and, in the, and put the moving pieces into their proper places. And then now they can move forward and start developing these characters in this show Hopefully, if it gets greenlit, they'll be able to develop these characters fully in the actual show itself. I mean, how else are you going to do this? How are you going to tackle? There's no way. How are you gonna, in 47 minutes? How are you going to fully develop six characters in a single backdoor pilot? You can't. I, it's, like, it's, it's, it's very, very hard to do that. Very and, difficult. And I think this is really the best decision. I felt like the, the way they decided to tackle this is prob- probably the only way they could have done it in a way that would have that did 
go over well with most of the audience for the most part. Now, we know some of the characters and where they've been, but one the one that actually introduced or interested me perhaps the most was actually Alex. Because we know where she came from and her tragic backstory about being involved with a vampire life. I, I agree. She was interesting. But in this, we see her moving forward. Even in the last couple of years, she had a couple of episodes. She was trying to go to school and was still a little bit uncomfortable or getting acclimated to the real world. But at this point, she now seems to be pretty well versed in what she wants to do and who she is. She seems like a well thought out and stable individual at this time. She's got a job. She's in the medical field and she knows that hunting has a big aspect on her life. And she, as she said, will always be there for Jody when she needs her, but it's not something she wants out of life. And I like that because as she talked to patients in this episode, she knows where she's coming from. She can relate to her problems, but she's also moved past a lot of the, I, I hate using this word in regards to Claire, but the angst that Claire still suffers from. Some of the issues that she has with not just hunting, but Jody's protective nature. What does she want out of life? Alex is pretty under control. She knows what she wants. There is a, there's a noticeable bit of resolve when it comes to Alex's character. She yes. has come to terms with her life and what it is. And I feel like I, for one, enjoyed the, the, the contrast yeah. between her and Sam because she's actually able to balance a normal life along with the supernatural in a way that Sam wanted to do. Never could. And never quite could. So I like that contrast. I like that they're taking similar issues, similar things that Sam and Dean might have wanted to attempt and actually show someone that is able to do it for the most part, at least currently. We'll see how it, how it ends uh, up later. How it goes, yeah. yeah. What I also like about her, what they've done with her is that she is kind of that Ash or Bobby character for the group. She's the medical examiner. She was immediately ready on the phone with the exact location as to where the boat yard was. She and it felt natural. It, it felt did, natural. It didn't feel pushed. It didn't no. feel contrived because when uh, Claire shows up at the hospital, I felt like it was it was not contrived. It felt like, oh, that's going to work out really good. She mm -hmm. works at a hospital. She has access to files of people who have been medical attention uh, and skills to help with wounds. Yeah, I like that. And it made sense. I, I think that was a very well done job and it fits a role that Supernatural has had before that with this group will they will need. Uh, and then, of course, we have Jody as the matriarch of the of the group of the family as the most well veteran hunter. And we get to see her trying to be a little bit of a parent, but also trying to be a mentor to this new group of people. With Claire, you have the, you know, guardian parental aspect, but also making the conscious decision that she has to let her move on and has to let her not so much let her go off on her own and do her own crazy style of hunting, which, you know, in this episode we see doesn't exactly work. But trust her and have faith in her enough that she's dependable and has the skills as a hunter that is needed to succeed in this world. Um, VW in the chat room says that Sam never wanted balance. Uh, maybe that was a poor choice of words I used, but it's something that Sam was hoping to find in his life. A normal life while at the same time, time being aware that the world of supernatural existed. He could, he could never, the point was he was never, he was never able to escape right. the supernatural in a way to where he could actually live a normal life. Alex has come to terms with it. That there I'm, is no escape. I know that it exists and I'm going to continue. In fact, she said that to Claire, I'm going to work. Yeah. I have a job. Yeah. I like that line. And you know, Jody has to, she has done a good job and they've made a, Great representation of making her realistic as far as the par parental side comes. Yeah. Where she has to make compromises, has to accept that Claire is going to go off and do things her way sometimes. So how do you find that balance where you can keep the family together, keep her safe while not being overbearing or a helicopter parent? Right. And as a parent, as your, yeah, kids, as your <laughs> kids grow up, sometimes you have to compromise in order to keep your family together, especially when... You're not dealing with an, a minor. You're not dealing with a child. You're dealing with a, a grown woman. 
who's out doing her own thing. And I, I know from firsthand experience with my own family that sometimes uh, your sibling or, you know, I've, I've, I've witnessed it where your sibling may not be doing exactly what the family had wanted that sibling to do. And you can either a continue to be divisive and push them farther and farther away, hmm. or you can compromise a bit and bring them back into the fold so you can keep an eye on them. Let them spread their wings. Let them do what they want. Let them live their life and compromise a bit so you can keep a closer eye on them. That's a smart parent. Right. That's well, what I would do with, it, with, with, a, with a big kid. You know, a kid. Yeah. Now, if you're under 18, I'm like, get your ass in here. <laughs> Werewolf haunting my ass. You I'm turn gonna, into a, a, a black mother? I'm going to beat you. <laughs> That just sounds like your no, mom. You're Mexican channeling your mom. Mother. Yeah. Like, Come here. Give me the warachis. I'm going to smack your ass. <laughs> you ever have to go out and cut your own switch? That kind of thing? No, we, we don't use switches. They use whatever they can fucking find. Mexican mother. <laughs> Whatever's available in the room. Uh, yeah, it's usually warachis, which is like Mexican flip flops. That shit hurts. <laughs> it's fucking leather. And if you have a Mexican mother, what happens to leather when it gets all wet from gardening? It gets it gets more painful. <laughs> I didn't realize they just opened a PTSD wound for Mike over there. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, my mom's like John Winchester. She was abusive. No, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just joking about John Winchester. I'm just joking. Oh. Joking. No, I, I they, love Mexican I, mothers. I, that's what mom told me to say at the end. Yeah. Now, I thought they did a really good job with Jody. Now, Claire has been a little bit of a mixed bag for a lot of the fandom, ourselves on this show included, and they've apparently showing her as being a better a better hunter than where we last left her. You know, last time we saw her she got turned into a werewolf temporarily while hunting even with Sam and Dean and McDavies at that time. And now she's able to take on a group of them by herself. And we see a little bit I think she's the one that's gotten the most in this episode little dash of motivation and the why to her character a bit a bit i feel like a they're very small bit i feel like there needs to be a bit more yes it was enough to give us why claire would come back or what her what she's been doing over these last few months or years presumably her coming back i, I understand because of sam and dean right? right i you know she feels like she owes him but i need to know the why behind her why is she so driven to be like this? Why is she exactly? Why does she want to be? I understand she wants to be proactive. I understand she doesn't want to be a victim. You know, she lived her life as as a victim, as a child, uh, witnessing her parents being slayed, you know, and or controlled or controlled by allegedly good beings, angels. She's been dealt a shit hand. So I understand not wanting to be a victim. But what's her drive currently? And I'm hoping if this series gets greenlit, if they're going to utilize Claire the way they are, then I need to understand her growth. I need to understand why. What is this reason? What is the reason behind her wanting to go kill things? Is she angry? Is she trying to prove something? I, I, I need to know why. Because all I see with her is someone who's very aggressive and upset. Yes. I don't understand why. And I think that's the thing that that not exactly bothered me, but... I had the most questions about with Sam. We knew in the very first pilot with Sam, we knew why he was aggressive. Yeah. Why he didn't want to be involved with the family business. We understood his disgruntlement with his father and, uh, and Dean and the life. We, even though we didn't understand the full, the gra the full gravity of the situation with Sam and his family, there were already those breadcrumbs being dropped. And we kind of can kind of draw our own conclusions. Oh, he doesn't get along with his family. Obviously, Dean's the good son. Sam is the one that wants to do his own the thing. The black sheep. The black sheep. So with Sam, we understood the why. We understood why he was aggressive towards his family. With Claire, we've now seen her, what, eight or nine times? I think something like that. And we still don't know the why. Yeah. Why is she like this? Why is she so broken? Yes, we know. We know because of the life she lived. It needs to be voiced in some way. Well, and when I say time, and when I say voiced, I'm not meaning you need to give us some dull exposition where she's talking about it. But we need to truly understand why she is who she is. And at the same time, while while she had a troubled past and a shit hand that was dealt to her, throughout the last few years, they've had moments to where 
it should be resolved. That part of her life, that chapter should be closed. Whether that was in season 10 with Angel Heart, which was the start of it, all the way to season 12 with Ladies Drink for Free, there should be hey. a point. And we talked about this at length in the previous episodes. And at girth. <laughs> I like that one better. That was good. We've talked about how Claire had seemed to get over some of that troubled past, right. become a better hunter, and understand that she can't do it alone. And then every time we saw her again, it seems to have regressed a little bit. And in this episode, when she's talking to Alex, was the key moment to me. Alex says, I have a job. She understands the balance. This will never not be a part of my life, but it cannot consume me completely. Whereas Claire is out on her own, not because Jody wants her to be, not because she has some monster she's tracking down like John Winchester did, but because she needs to prove to someone or at least herself that she is doing the right thing, that she is a hunter. I am saving people. I am doing this. That is who I am. I'm a big girl. It, it kind of condescendingly, it kind of felt like that. I'm questioning why, why, who are you trying to prove something to? Is it yourself? Have you not done that already through working with Sam and Dean having saved in this episode, Sam and Dean, why are you so gung ho about feeling like, I, I feel like she's trying to replicate Dean's life. Like he said, I will go down gun in hand. That is how I'm supposed to die. She and also she did it steals that kind of mantra yeah. in this episode but I don't understand why she's never cared a great deal of respect for how they've gone about becoming hunters. She feels like she can do it too. And it feels teenage. To me. Yeah. It's, it's odd. It, Cause I think her whole demeanor is like that. Her entire, the way she acts with everybody yeah. is I don't give a fuck her, fuck you. her <laughs> smirks that she does when Jody tells her things, the smirk at patience when she says she, you're going to die. You look like uh, rock and she, roll Barbie. She rolls her eyes. She doesn't give a fuck about anything. Yeah. And guess what? I can get behind the emo. I'm okay with that. Let's Kylo Ren her fine. Let's do it. But we need to know the why at this yes. point in time going on, what, five years of Claire, roughly uh, four years, uh, four years of Claire. We need to start understanding the why behind it. And that's something that I was really looking forward to seeing in the backdoor pilot specifically. I know this wasn't about development, as we were saying. Right. However, the writers chose to utilize her as the perspective of this pilot, which means She's also more than likely going to be the perspective of the, of, show. of the show if it gets greenlit. So why did we not flesh that out? We need to understand. Once I can understand her, because I understand Alex, I understand Jody, I understand, I understand, I understand Donna, I understand Kaya, I understand Absolutely. Patience. The only one that I don't understand their drive is Claire. Yeah. And I feel like that's the problem. If she's going to be your voice of the show, she's going to be narrating it and writing in a journal, then I think we need to understand if anybody was going to have any type of true development, we needed to really delve into her then and flesh out that 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 issue. Yeah. No. I mean, and they kind of get into that a little bit, but we're, we'll come back to the end of the, the episode here. We also have because we're this is just a few of the six characters. We also have Donna, who I, I loved her in this episode. Her interaction with Jody feels very similar to Sam and Dean to me, to a Rufus and Bobby. That is the duo who work well together. And her appearance, while it wasn't anything grandstanding, it wasn't a you know a great entrance necessarily. She drove up and said, you know, how's it going, everybody? But her mannerisms where I brought the essentials and it's all these guns and knives. All right. Hold on really fast. In yeah. the chat room, uh, Demon Jen says, Dean had a vulnerability to him. Claire doesn't. Uh, Demon Myth Maverick says, which is crazy, Mike. She's the one that's been built before the season the most and we still don't know why. So a lot of people are expressing agreement. Similar viewpoint. Yeah, it's not, it's not a, a Claire hate train. It's like, who... Like, wh why? 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 It's really why. 
Yeah. Why are you like this? I, I'm, and, and why do they continue to use her as well if we're not going to explore these things? Right. So, And we'll get into that more in a moment. Yeah, especially with the end of the episode. Um, but Donna having all the guns and all the knives and being like, yeah, these are the essentials. I'm from Minnesota. That's the reasoning. I Some love of it. her lines felt like something Dean would say. Donna was fun. It was fun. And she was. It, it, isn't that what people already say kind of on the internet that Donna's like the Dean? Haven't they always said that they had kind of a kinship there where they would eat the donuts together like in that one episode? Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. So I kind of like that they keep playing with that. And and the Dean's little bit of humor that he's always able to pepper throughout his personality in every episode. Yeah, I, I love Donna her. Can, seems to channel into that same idea. I'm from Minnesota. Like, this is just what we do. Donna is one of my absolute favorite characters. And the moment, and I know a few people wrote this on our Facebook page, the moment she pops up, the show comes together. And that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. If you introduce your your other character and suddenly everything comes together, that's exactly what you want. That's exactly what you want. And the moment Jody and Donna are on screen together, it's the chemistry just goes through. You can feel it. That's, to me, when it felt like Supernatural. Truly felt like Supernatural. Yes, these were characters I had known of, and I was watching the show, and Sam and Dean are here. But that's when it felt like Sam and Dean, Bobby Rufus, that humor mixed in with, you know, shotguns locked and loaded as we're going into some very dangerous situation. It felt like the show that I've loved for years. Regardless of who was leading that charge regardless of what actor regardless of what actual show whether it's wayward sisters or supernatural it still felt the same and yeah. that's one of the main things that bloodlines was tragically missing yeah there's some there's some banter going back and forth yes. in the chat they said basically oh, I you're about the show between no, no, Don and Jody. <laughs> no and the chat they're talking about um the differences the differences between uh claire and dean some are saying claire is not angsty she's rude others are saying well dean was the same way and i feel like let me just say that it's all interpretive yes we, we all are going to interpret things differently and that's the beautiful it's thing subjective, yeah yeah every, that's the beautiful thing about television and movies and this type of art form but whether you want to say dean was rude or angsty or whatever or claire vice versa there was the why Exactly. There was the why. I behind. always knew why Dean was upset. Yeah. When you write a character, you, you want to start with the why. Okay. Character A, let's say it's Zack Snyder. Okay. You write down a few things. Well, he's going through this, this, and this. this is how he feels. He's a badass. He kicks ass. He likes to. What drives. You know, he has a chip on his shoulder. And then you have a question mark. But why? And then you go from there. That's how you develop your characters. You you have to start with the why once you get your your the idea of the character and who you kind of want him to be you then need to make him realistic and that's that's, and that's where the why comes from that's the greatest revelation of any character in any narrative why walter Walter white from breaking exactly why what's the why he was screwed over even gus free has been there was a why there's always why if you look at some of the greatest characters protagonist and even antagonist and especially antagonist and any type of literature there's the why it doesn't yeah. matter what your interpretation is whether they're an asshole a dick the godfather angsty, angry a fuck face a motherfucker it doesn't matter what your interpretation is of them but there but one thing can't be denied and it's the the why of it you don't have that you don't have a character yeah and I think that's the biggest thing. Even if people didn't agree with Dean at certain points, especially some of this season. Right. Yeah. Or if people haven't agreed with Claire. But there was, but there was the why. Why did Dean whip a gun out at Kaya, a, a, a poor girl? Who did nothing. Why did he do it? We know why. He's desperate to, he's desperate for his mother. Yes. He wants his mother back. Mommy issues. Yes. And that's to the, a severe that's degree. The, that's the ultimate why, though. Yeah. That has driven him in so For years. Yeah. yeah, but with Claire, that's somewhat been resolved, or at least it's been painted as if it has been. Yeah, and and there was a time where we understood the why. Yeah, in the, yeah. her beginning. Yeah, a bit. So ultimately, though, bringing it back just a a bit here. For me, when Joni and Donna are on screen, hmm. I feel like 
they they resemble to me like you were saying that's the supernatural element it's sam and dean it's rufus yep. and bobby it, it's it feels right as soon as they're on screen they're that archetype that we've come to expect yes. in supernatural the, yes. the team up the hunter team up the duo uh it feels so good and i'm hoping we get more of that moving in to if this series gets greenlit fingers crossed i hope they they delve into that a lot more focus on that give us that archetype don't change that one bit jody and donna are everything they are so fucking good together on yeah. screen they they sold it for me yeah they sold that to where this i can completely see this taking off with this style as long as they're part of it okay so another posing thought here because i want to be fair okay uh it's just a bunch of numbers i don't know the name of the person she's barely 21 no one figures themselves out especially with that much trauma at that age fair enough it's I, not I, about figuring yourself out though yeah fair, i would argue uh, well hold on i i get that point but then again we're, we're not dealing with with uh, a psychological profile on a real person we'll de- we're dealing with a potential yeah. protagonist for a tv show you have to understand their why yeah they're this, not a real person i mean like that sounds odd to say but as a character they have to have that moving going into it yeah i'm not saying she's bad i'm saying that we we need to know the why and again it's not something they can't fix it's not something that can't be done at any point let me clarify that thomas because i'm not i'm not shit talking here i am trying to i'm trying to digest what we watched and then speculate what they can do moving forward to help flesh out the character. That's all I'm saying. I'm not stop. I'm not a Claire hater. I think I'm one of the bigger fans of Claire on this, on this show. I don't have an issue with her. I've always been pro Claire for the most part. More than anybody. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to know more because I like her. I want to know the why What's making her tick, especially Thomas again, just to reiterate, she's no doubt going to be the lead. Yeah of wayward sisters it's very obvious from so this that's episode. so if that's the case then we need to understand these things yeah and again it's more of a question to me because it seems like the whys from before had been relatively resolved and yet every time i see her again it feels like she's taken a step backwards off screen that i didn't see so again these aren't things that can't be remedied and we're not trying to lambast her as a character but i like that word lambast yeah Yeah, it's a it's a good word it's a fun one but it's something that needs lambast yeah it's something that needs to be addressed uh the last two characters patience and kaya they have the most potential still to be fleshed out we know that patience came to jody to help out because she had a horrifying vision but in this episode alone i loved what they did with her because she wasn't i i gave her crap as a character before for being a bit of a Mary Sue. She was already a good fighter. She was the team volleyball. Right, she right. was a genius. You know, in this. A stable genius? A stable genius. <laughs> in this, she was very <laughs> unsure of herself. Very in a new, a fish out of water. was, And it, it felt refreshing because she has been introduced to this world, but she's not immediately an expert at it. She is not Alex or Jody. I loved how she held the shotgun. Like, what do I do? Yeah. What, what, what am I, I doing with what this? What do I do with this? It was something hot about it, too. Like, oh, okay. what, what do I do with Step this? on my neck. Right? Just grab it <laughs> and then point it at me. That's what you do with it. Oh, God. My God, man. I have a thing for patience, I think. You got a thing for danger. That's yeah. what you have. I'm Iceman. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Oh. No, but I I liked how she didn't know what she wanted. She wanted to go back to her dad, but she still wanted part of this life too yeah. because it made her feel like she could yeah. contribute more. She didn't know how to shoot, and she was you know okay. discovering a whole new side of herself. Okay, so I have a question then for you, Thomas. Yeah, um, you weren't really keen on her necessarily when you were when she was first introduced, not because she, she wasn't interesting, but you felt like again the I hate this word. I know but, you do. You felt like she was a bit of a Mary Sue. Now, yeah. you, you said that was the only issue you had. Now, seeing her in this episode, do you feel like that that was a bit that that issue you had with her was a little was resolved? Oh, yeah, absolutely. OK, I think they did that. Well, that's a positive. Barons then. and Dab did a great job. She feels much more like a real character to me. She's getting grossed out by the alien thing, whatever it is that Alex and Jody are just completely numb to at this point. 
She doesn't know how to interact with all these people or how to handle the situation. She wants to leave. And part of that to me is that element of a hero, the refusal of the call. I don't want to be a part of this. And Patience fills that role very well. So I do like what they did with her. And I'm excited to see her grow as a character should the show get greenlit. Uh, yep. And her interaction with Jody, with Donna, with Alex, and even with Claire as to how she can learn from them and what it's going to say for her character moving forward. Yeah, I agree. 100%. Kaya is perhaps the most interesting character because she's had so little time. And yet at the end of this episode, her story has changed so dramatically. With very little detail, and that was obviously for a distinct reason, but the fact that she is going to be playing a huge part moving forward, we use the Star Wars reference a lot this season, but she could be very much a Kylo Ren setup. She's gone through tragedy. Part of her has embraced it. She's got a whole new look to her by the end of the episode. And I'm that really did interest me a lot. I am curious as to see what they're going to do with her character moving forward. Yeah, she is so much potential and so many unanswered questions. So much epicness that this character could unleash. And just for a second, the the actor herself mm-hmm. is just she's an amazing talent. And I, I posted this. The minute I watched the episode on yeah, Twitter, I saw it. <laughs> because I, I, that was the only thing I needed to say, like because that was what stuck out to me. I, I, I'm, I'm drawn to the academic merits of television and and movies. It's just, it's just what I like. And when I see a performance like this from someone who doesn't have a lot of experience, she is fairly new on the scene, and you understand her and what she's going through just through looks. Facial expression. And that is the art of acting. Acting isn't talking. It isn't telling us how you feel. It's being able to. I was sad. It's being able to convey thoughts and emotions through glances. Behavior. She is a fantastic get for Wayward Sisters. And it's only up. It's only downhill. Uphill. Wow, geez. No, no. Downhill or uphill from here. It's e- I want it to be easier. It's up. only. No. Oh. Uphill is hard. It can you, only move up from here. It's there a, you it's go. A, Thank you. Like, it's just, it's very, she's a great get. She is yeah. the the classic. Remember, we always talk about how Supernatural has always managed to cast those fabulous talents, and they end up being super lucky. Like, the casting department yeah. has always done a great job, for the most part, with our guest roles and our side characters, and this is just yet more the same. Yeah, Absolutely. I, I bet you they can throw anything at her and she'll be able to deliver. The fact that she's playing, obviously, um, something very different as well. Looks like she's be if she comes back, we don't know. But we do know that she came back as a as a secondary or a villain of sorts. Yeah. And I'm see, certain. And to see her play that, if she ends up being that villain as well. I mean, to see her playing two roles, that's fun. That'd I love those. I love those dual roles. Especially with the. Again, I, I, I know I'm a broken fucking record. I keep blowing this idea. But the multiverse concept yeah. and to what is possible with different characters who are themselves but are different entirely with Kaya as well. I mean, that's that's com- a whole new realm of possibility. And I mean, it, the fact that it's Kaya is this Kylo Ren costume get up at the very end of the episode the questions that that leads into is, is the bad place a version of Earth where there's people we know who exist there? Is yeah. Kaya from that? Or did she get trapped there from a different version of herself? Yeah. Why is that? Why? She, I mean, pretty obviously, but is that why she's been drawn there since she was a child? Yeah. Is it the same person or is there something more well, to this? I'm sure we'll find out. Is it like, the, is it an, is it the evil one only? Is the is the good one uh, actually for real dead? Is What's, there more than one? Well, we're dealing with multiple universes, and she's yeah. connected to them. So, are we going to see other versions of her? Obviously, we know she is a permanent cast member for Wayward Sisters, so she is coming back in some capacity. I and I hope so too, because she's fucking good. Again, and with the amount of questions they gave us with that end shot. I think that they have to develop into that. They have to have some ideas for what they're doing with that. All right. We're falling a little behind. So let's jump into the perspective aspect and kind of move through it fairly fast because we've kind of uh, 
thought already kind of went into a lot of this. Right. Now, Supernatural has shifted perspectives from Sam and Dean throughout the years, but they've been very careful, but, but with, you know, with careful analysis of the earlier seasons, it's very clear that the narrative was always about Sam's story from the perspective of Dean. And with Wayward Sisters, it seems like they're kind of doing a similar setup with the perspective, at least at the moment, being from Claire. You know, this episode has Claire bookend the entire story with her narration, what she's doing, why is she alone on this? And it it started and ended with her, and it served the story in this episode just fine. And it gives them an opportunity to focus on her as a character. And again, what I'm interested in is their interactions as a team. Keep the ensemble group tighten it, keep that family focus, but you you can't tell it from everyone's perspective every time. No, you have to have a perspective. That way you can focus your narrative and keep the show led by the ensemble cast tight, and that's kind of the downfall. I'm not saying you can't shift perspectives from time to time, but for the most part... Yeah, be careful. Yeah, and I think they chose their path. The, the perspective will be from Claire, um, and I think ultimately choosing that one perspective is smart. You're dealing with six characters. You need an emotional perspective anchor when you're writing a show like this. Right. Now, the idea of using Claire but possibly shifting to someone like Kaya reminds me of Sam and Dean. It's it's the it could be very easily the story of Kaya from Claire's perspective. Yeah, you you you're using Claire as the perspective, but you're shifting the importance of the myth arc on someone like Kaya. I mean, she seems to be the one with the most prevalent powers and right. the most interesting story moving forward. And that is exactly what they do with Sam and Dean. For right. the most part. And this is debatable. I know we've gotten to discussions in depth with other supernatural um bands, bands. Yeah. and I think most people agree that the earlier seasons were from Dean's perspective. I'd say seasons one through five at least. Yeah. And, and again, they did shift from a few times episode throughout. to episode. Yeah, yeah. But for the most part, the, the main story was driven by his perspective and it was about Sam. Yes. Very much so. And they are, it seems like they are borrowing those ideas, ideas to craft their story. And I'm for that. I like that. And I, I feel like you're not relying just on one character. You're dealing with your ensemble cast. And obviously once the story gets going, if, if this story gets, if this pilot gets greenlit moving forward, you're going to have six additional cast members plus any supporting cast you end up bringing in as well. Which gives the, you new possibilities. Yeah. So I, I feel like it takes the stress off of just one character, and also people who may not be into Claire. I feel like yeah. there's going to be enough going on to enjoy the show if you're not the Claire person, per se. If you're not a fan of Claire, don't let one person's control you know, your view of the show. Yeah, you're dealing with six individuals, six characters that are making up the story as a whole. And I think the fact that you have that group of characters and that if it gets greenlit, they can shift from that is interesting shit. because they can, shift. they can shit from that they can they can take a shit yeah. if they want to and go to a different character entirely <laughs> but that does leave the question of what about Jody and Donna and their role in this show it was always pitched before as Jody kind of leading this house of wayward sisters the the girls and their adventures moving forward but with the shifting perspective is it always going to be Claire as you said or can we have some of it being Jody and Donna. What is Donna's role going to be? Is she going to be this other half of this parental coin that leads them and teaches them how to be hunters? Or are they going to be more supporting roles and just kind of there? Is Donna going to be the fun, you know, kind of like a Bobby to us in the beginning yeah, of the show? I honestly hope my as a fan. Okay, as, I'm talking as a fan now. Honestly, I, I don't want them being shifted into just the supporting roles. Right. Uh, unfortunately, if you look at the CW's track record, that's exactly what's going to end up happening to them. And I'm hoping it doesn't. But it can be prevented. And I, I think that if Dab or whoever ends up being the showrunner of Wayward Sisters, hopefully it's Barron's. I'm, yeah, there's I'm, no reason it should be I'm rooting be for Robert Barron's to be the showrunner. They need to be taken off the demo leash. And they need to be allowed to tell a story that benefits the chosen narrative, not dictated by execs at the CW. And that's what made Supernatural so different. Because they didn't abide. They didn't have a leash. They, they had no leash. They had no idea if there'd be another season. They had no idea if there'd be another fucking episode. And so they were free to tell the story as it needed to be told. 
not how they felt that the audience wanted it to be told based on demographic and recent trends. Yeah, because that that's what all those characters, like even like in Riverdale and and Ugh. other shows Ugh. that deal with parents and older individuals, they always get tossed into the wise. I have an 18 year old yeah. son, but I'm 34. Yeah, and they're pushed <laughs> into the background. They're given about 10 to 15 minutes of screen time and they just end up being supporting with really no true relevance to the story, to the shaping, to the shaping of the narrative or the myth arc, and I feel like or the when you, characters, right? And I, I feel like that when you have characters like that are as talented as Kim Rhodes and Brianna Buckmaster, they need to be utilized. Do not waste that. D- don't waste it. They need to be front and center. They need to be more than just supporting roles because they are good. I mean, look at the fans. I mean, countless people have said, I'm not talking about looking at fan service, but sometimes you need to look and see what works. And a lot of the fans were like, man, sh-. the same thing we said when Jody and Don are on screen together. Damn, that's good. Yeah. So I'm not saying the entire thing needs to be that. Obviously, no, and I don't think it should be. And we're dealing with an ensemble cast. So we already know that it's not going to, I don't want to only be about Donna and, and uh, Jody, but let's also let's make not ignore sure, them either. Yeah. Let's not push him to the background. Uh, you know, let's utilize them. Let's use all six of our ensemble cast members to really tell the story and push it forward and give us something that we've never been able to do before because we were always dealing with two leads for the most part, maybe three. If you if you want to include Castiel with Supernatural, yeah, let's take advantage of it. Let's utilize everyone. Let's make everyone matter and count. That's how they've done it for the last few years. Yeah, keep it going, right? Now, Sam and Dean were not completely out of this episode, although I don't know how much screen time they had, but compared to when I think back to Bloodlines, they didn't feel like it was they were missing that much. You know, they didn't have a lot of time themselves, but what they had, it, it didn't feel like they weren't on the screen that much. It felt like an episode of Supernatural, which is a great point in its favor. And what we did get was fucking great. And it felt truly Sam and Dean, even though they took a backseat for the main story to develop to get them out of the situation they were in, they were still themselves and it was still fun. And I didn't think seeing Dean, you know, just cook a lizard could be funny. But it was. But it was. <laughs> and again, that's where I drew that parallel between him and Donna. Those little lines, those little interactions of a situation that's not exactly funny, but it's delivery and personality that makes it fun. And it wasn't the over the top Dean. And that's something we've exactly. talked about throughout season 13 about, you know, to be a caricature or not to be. And this was one of those moments that just felt sincere to Dean, you know, and it was realistic. It was like, Hey, it doesn't taste like chicken, which is what we all expected him to say. That's why it was funny. Right. And he's all, no, it tastes like a lizard. What do you think it tastes like? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, just you little, fucking idiot. Yeah, little <laughs> things like that were, it, it just, those are the reasons why we love Supernatural and just little moments like that. And what I loved about that scene, too, though, was that it made sense to the characters at the at when where they had been in their life. Dean had been in purgatory for a long, long yeah. fucking time. You're right. Yeah. He's used to. Yeah, I'll eat this weird ass lizard and I'll keep fighting and I'll keep running and see how much ammo I've got. Sam is not used to that scenario. You know, Sam spent time in hell and as did Dean, but that's a completely different environment. This, you know, Bear Grylls survival that Dean had to endure before he's used to. And I liked that because it felt like they weren't forgetting about their past. Right. It felt true to it. So I liked that a lot. So I think it's time to take a couple of comments from Facebook. We had a lot of feedback on this one, which made sense. A lot of people had a lot invested in Wayward Sisters. uh, When you go through those, I'm sure you probably already picked a few. Uh, make sure we focus on some negative and some positive as well, because I know I, I want to get a full feeling for how the fandom felt about right. about the about the backdoor pilot. So Christina Johansson said, my main pet peeve is the one I have with many other shows. Women are not as physically strong as men. So the hand to hand combat at the beginning was a bit unrealistic, especially as Claire doesn't have any superpowers. But unlike how the other women. She doesn't. But I liked how the other. I thought I was being grouchy and mean. My superpower is being mad all the time. Mean face. Mean face. Very scary. <laughs> That's a werewolf, remember? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. <laughs> uh, she's like, but I liked how the other women relied on firearms. Right. The story was good, and I really liked the emotional moments. No one can say Catherine Newton isn't a good actor after watching this. 
If this doesn't go to series, I will be so pissed. It's leagues better than 90% of the CW shows. I can't disagree with that comment there. I agree very much with her statement about uh, the opening scene with Claire feeling a little off because werewolves are supposed to be stronger than people. Right. And so her just kind of punching one. I let it slide, but it did bother me. It's something we see a lot in TV shows and movies. It's... It's always been there, unfortunately, but recently there has been a trend moving away from that. And um, there was a movie recently uh, starred, uh, that starred uh, Charlie Theron where she specifically talked about this in her P- PR run that she did for her movie Atomic Blonde. She specifically talked about that. Her pet peeve is very similar to Christina Johansson. She had an she has an issue seeing women taking on men. She's Huge win, ass burly it, it fighter, just, dude. Yeah, she's all, it just doesn't make sense. So when she got on board, she spoke to the director and and the stunt coordinator and said, "Hey, I'm a kick ass chick in this movie. I beat people up. Fine, this is why I wanted to do this. But let's make it realistic. Let's choreograph scenes to where." I use the fact that my smaller stature is why I can fight well. Right. Let's focus on that. Let's use the the weight of the men in my favor. Let's use their burly stature as a favor to my fighting to as that. my fighting technique. So because they did that, you got a, a a movie like Atomic Blonde where it was a bit more realistic when it came to the fighting because it was a a, a woman who is a smaller stature than a guy and it came off a little bit more realistic. So I do understand the recent argument or the recent issues with that because as we watch more and more TV as the years go by, we are becoming a more intelligent audience. We are wanting more solid stories when it comes to TV. Obviously, if you watch anything Marvel, obviously that's not the case. But when it comes to TV, we're getting smarter and we expect things to make sense a bit more, I would say, right? Yeah, I, I think that needs to be taken into account moving forward because as you said we're getting smarter as an audience it's it's it it results in a disconnect or destroys the immersion for people like christina johansson or myself even honestly though the part that my first brain went to is like that's a monster werewolves are stronger than humans guy or girl alone that thing should be kicking her ass and this is why claire should have stayed a werewolf because that would have been so cool you had a super. She could have easily found them too. And super powered in. villain, a super powered. Oh, I'm sorry, a super powered hero. Plus, I mean, we've already seen it with Gar, so we know it's possible to balance that out. I think that would have been cool. And then, plus, and she would have been able have, to infiltrate that group so easily through their scent. I'm here for dinner. She can smell through their scent. I'm a werewolf too. I smell the werewolves. <laughs> he walks on four or so. Uh, oh, four, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> And then she has a shotgun. Yeah. (laughs) She uses her her feet for it to shoot him. Oh, wow. She's like Beast from (laughs) (laughs) X-Men. Oh, man. All right. Next one. All right. Samantha Levitin says, never been a fan of Claire before Wayward Sisters. And now after watching the episode, her character is finally starting to look like one of the good characters in the series. She kind of reminds me of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, blonde hair, fierce, and kills monsters. Uh, the sick new monster reminds me of the Predator in a good way. The ladies crushed it in their backdoor pilot debut. I've always long loved strong female characters through film and TV. And I love seeing a whole cast of smart, strong, and independent women. I hope that... What the- does that even mean, though? Smart, strong, and independent women. I don't know. I, I need clarification on that. You need, you need clarification? I need pers- perspective on that. They're smart. Okay, not Ryan. So you don't like <laughs> dumb... <laughs> Weak, independent, <laughs> dependent women. <laughs> All right. Uh, I hope that the spinoff goes off without a hitch and becomes a successful TV series. Not in- insanely successful like Supernatural, but decently successful nonetheless. I mean, I like smart, strong people in general. Right. I, I don't know anybody that likes dumb people. They're funny. Funny to make fun of. Well, listen to us, right? That's tr- that's true. <laughs> very true. We are very dumb and weak. Without us, without that, we don't have a show, right? That's true. Uh, looking forward to Wayward Sisters season one, fingers crossed. Yeah. Um, yeah. I can agree. Uh, Nathan Cox says, I dig it. They nailed the tone. It very much felt like it did supernatural justice, and they set up what could be really interesting story arc. They did a good job making me care about the characters and give a crap about deeper relationships between them. Good. The uh, positivity. There is a lot out there. 
Uh, so this this is a long one, but we'll go into it. Terry, I, I apologize, Terry Baller. I have all the love for Wayward Sisters, all the members of this family, but from individual tragedies have different built from individual tragedies have different roles to play within the hunting family unit. Jody is the glue and the physical presence that holds the girls together, dispensing veteran hunter sage advice while communicating that choices can't be made for the girls. Jody is not too old to learn a lesson or two herself. Donna is sympathetic ear for Jody, a practical trainer and level-headed hunter. Also, she's funny as hell. Alex straddles the hunter and civilian worlds to make her practical contributions. Something we talked about at length. Uh, in this dual role, she's able to mediate for Jody. Patience, while not having a hunter's tools and skills or even full knowledge of her own gifts, has a moral compass that will not let her abandon those who she sees are in danger. Her premonitions can be misinterpreted or derailed like Sam's or Eva's. Uh, Claire is the enforcer who acts based on heart, like Dean Winchester, who considers himself a piece of crap grunt one day and the best hunter on the planet the next. I love that she's uh, a fledging woman of letters chronicling her exploits and emotions, despite her denial of broken at the end and going out in a blaze of glory philosophy. It's a, uh, is a totally fucked up hero characteristic. Kaya was the most vulnerable and reluctant to act for a good reason. Therefore, a true victim who was essentially along for the ride once she fessed up to what had happened with Sam and Dean. Uh, alternate Kaya is going to be what drives the plot. Cannot wait to see for the foreseeable future. So a, a lot of restating stuff that we went into we actually, in this episode. Yeah, you know what? We actually were on the same page, it seems like, with Terry quite a bit. Uh, she says, production-wise, I love the mirror knock-knock and the cold open, though I wish I'd, they'd given Claire a better line than I kill monsters. Uh, last little bit here, she says, Jody Mills and Company's family business makes a slightly more acceptable reason for the boys to be leaving Sioux Falls in someone else's hands right. than the lame reason they left the entire city of Chicago to Enos in Bloodlines. <laughs> I agree. That was a, even though it was it was only a couple seconds, it got the point across, and that's something that, uh, I want to say uh, the character Jody Mills has been going back and forth with the Winchesters for quite some time. I want to say for the last couple of years, she would always reiterate, I got this covered. I, I'm i good. I'm just calling you guys to ask you a question. That's it. I don't. I got this handled. So for her to say that would make a lot of sense to who she is. I mean, mm. they wouldn't come and run at the drop of a hat if any other hunter said, yeah. hey, I have uh, an issue here with some vampires. They just wouldn't Figure because, it out, dude. because they Click. understand that the other hunters got it covered, that they can take care of themselves. And the right. fact that they're starting to see Jody Mills in that same light, or they do see her in that same light now, I feel makes a lot of sense to to the growth of not just Jody, but to their their relationship with her, Sam and Dean. Right. Uh, probably the last one here. Mike, I, I apologize for you ruining your name, but it says a much better backdoor pilot than bloodlines i can see the diary dialogue getting a little old but it is a cw show so it's not unexpected oh love how they brought a new monster into the lore but worried about the show being located in one town also love the giant at the end but it uh but hope it doesn't come back and i don't think it will i don't think there's a way in which you have that be the major threat or transverse the planes of existence at that time but it's I, well, I that's kind of what we said, right? That it's it's good. It's good as a little teaser and look at what else is out right. there. We don't need to deal with it. Yeah. Well, it's just it's too too much. It's too much. Yeah. For Supernatural. But what we got of it, I felt worked perfectly. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. I think with that, we'll go into final thoughts. Mike, what oh. do you think about this episode? Oh, what do you grade please, it? Please don't go to me first. I'm going. Who else am I going to go to? I'm trying to pull up. Go to Ryan real fast. Ryan, what do you think? All right, great. Thanks, Ryan. <laughs> I'm I'm kind of glad. Did, has anyone heard from him yet? About, I don't even know if he's alive. Because I know he said he couldn't <laughs> show up, but has he watched the episode yet? Because I'm I'm dying to hear what he thinks too. I haven't heard anything. You know what? We'll have him uh, tell us his brief thoughts maybe at the beginning of next week's we show. Go. The only reason I know he's alive, presumably, is Instagram. <laughs> and he was on a plane. I don't know if it crashed, but <laughs> he was at least on the plane. All right, so I enjoyed the backdoor pilot. There's a lot of potential, and that's pretty much all I'm looking for in a pilot. I want to see reasons why I'm going to want to continue to watch. 
that's the purpose of the pilot. It's supposed to hook you. And I feel like it did do that. It gave us enough of the supernatural vibe that we needed so that we feel like it belongs in this world of supernatural. Again, going back to bloodlines, which hopefully eventually we can stop using that as, as, a, a, reference as a reference point. But for now, it's going to have to, we're going to have to keep using it. But, you know, bloodlines could have been made to feel like it belonged in the world of supernatural, but they tried to change so much and what we understood of the monster world and they flipped it upside down all yeah. in 47 minutes. And we were supposed to walk away thinking, Oh yeah, that's legit. Yeah. That feels like supernatural. It's totally not what we envisioned for the past, you know, nine years at that point. That's something that the wayward sisters didn't try to do. They slowly introduced last year start starting with last year with the idea of of alternate realities alternate universes and then they use that to to catapult the myth arc for season 13 and at the same time weaving in the backdoor pilot starting way back with the the patience episode patience, episode three and they're using elements that were already using in the supernatural show itself so to take those elements use it to craft your show it automatically feels like it's supernatural because we've already seen it in supernatural they're not right. expecting us to believe in something by changing or retconning things and then saying hey you guys are going to deal with it we're going to explain it later and i feel like they did a good job for the most part there's a few things that i question with the decisions but it's not my show uh i feel like ultimately it's a success when it comes to a backdoor pilot i'm a bit I'm a bit flabbergasted that they chose to use Claire as the um, sounding piece. Yeah, as the perspective that kind of keeps everything together. And not because I, I'm against Claire, but because she's such a divisive character. She is a character right. that is liked just as much as she's disliked amongst the supernatural fandom. And I feel like they're drawing a line in the sand with it, saying, hey, you guys don't like Claire Fuck you. Not only is she going to be in the show, but she's also going to be the lead and the perspective. Right. That I'm just dangerous territory when the show is trying to get off the ground. Right. Again, not because I dislike her, but just because of the nature of her character. Would they do this with any other character that was so what's the word? Controversial. Controversial. Like, would they? No other show would do that. If you do a consensus. I mean, there's movies that do those screenings and they do consensus and they're like, Hey, this person hated this character. Well, how many people like 25, 30% of the audience. Ooh, we're going to have to recast or let's change some things around. Maybe take the focus away. Right. Keep her there, there, make her important, but don't put it in Not people. the limelight. Right. So that's, I'm, I'm questioning that. And I have faith in, in Barron's. And if he ends up being the showrunner, then I'm, I will be 100% on board. I, it's not a deal breaker. I'm just left scratching my head, wondering why they would go against what so many people. And, and you know what? You could also say though, like this isn't about necessarily fan service. Like I don't care what you say, but yeah, you could argue that, but point. at the same, for the, the same time though, this show came about due to fan due to service. Fan service. So that being said, why not do something a bit different with your perspective? That makes sense. Yeah. So I give this episode a B. It's a it's a solid pilot, and uh, there's plenty of potential. All right. And of course, the technical achievements and academic qualities are just through the roof. That's what really made the pilot for me. Yeah. Is the fact that they didn't hold back. Yeah, for me, this, like you said, what made it for me was stuff that I've wanted to see for quite some time. The practical effects of the new Predator-esque creatures, the visual effects of the gorilla monster, monstrosity, King Kong's cousin, whatever you want to call it. The interesting concept behind Kaya becoming this new alternate reality villain and seeing that moment with Jody and Donna to where it really felt like supernatural. And to me, that was the litmus test. Bloodlines never felt like supernatural. Not even once, except for the two or three did, scenes. Did you say a clitness test? Clitness test? Yeah, is that what you said? I said a litmus oh, test. Oh, okay. 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 No one's pointing a shotgun at you right now, Mike. You got you to dial it down a little bit. I, I thought it was a clitness test. No, a litmus test. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm clear now. 
Bloodlines didn't feel like supernatural. And even with the few scenes that Sam and Dean were in, it felt more like one of those Scooby Doo's, like with the Globe Trotters, you know, like with Sam and Dean, a garbage show. This <laughs> felt, even though they weren't in it very much, felt like supernatural, especially with Donna showing up and her interaction with Jody. The way in which they go about things fit. The characters are pretty interesting, but I will give it to you, Mike. The biggest conundrum I had was Claire. And I know Ryan is not a fan of her, and I know you're a big supporter of her. And for me, I'm the asshole who's always been on the fence because it's varied from episode to episode. And with this one, I too, my biggest thing is why? What are you trying to prove and who are you trying to prove it to? You know, we get a little bit of her kind of getting over that by the end of the episode. But to me, that didn't explain her behavior all the way up until that point. And I think that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not the worst thing ever because it is something we can add into the context yeah, of the story it's later. It's not a deal breaker. It's not a deal breaker. No. And there's there was so much work that had to be done to get this whole concept going. And the breadcrumb idea, I think, absolutely paid off. When I look at it as a pilot episode on its own, however, if you come into this just to watch this one, or if you catch Wayward Sisters, let's say it gets Greenland, you catch it in an episode later, and you're interested, and you're like, I want to go back and watch some of this. This pilot episode on its own doesn't explain a whole lot to me. I'd have to watch a lot of other things. So to me, that was a little bit of a weakness in its against it, but I had a good time with what was there. I think that a few changes to things like why Claire's doing what she's doing and what they can do with these characters moving forward. It's not quite enough to give a full judgment. It was a fun episode. A pilot. Right. It's a pilot. You got to give it a little bit of slack for that. And I know many of us, myself included, we want to compare it to the supernatural pilot. And you shouldn't. But that is God. That's on. That's unprecedented. It's it's very hard. Most pilots suffer from the similar things that we're discussing now. Yeah. So for me, this episode also a B. I enjoyed a lot of it. I think there were some things that could have been worked on. And the biggest thing is, if I hadn't known any part of this, I wouldn't know what the hell this is a launching point for another show. Yeah, exactly. So. It won't do what Bloodlines did. Once again, let's use that. Yeah. Where you're watching it on Netflix years later, like, what the hell the is, fuck this? is this? Whereas this feels like, yes, it might be strange that you're not seeing Sam and Dean, but you're not going to question, like, what is It this? didn't feel like that odd. Yeah. So with that, guys, we've been talking about this for way too long. Can you tell we're back from break? Yeah. We That is going to wrap it up here for us at Supernatural The Crossroads. Thank you all for listening. Make sure to check us out on Facebook, Twitter, all the places Holler. you know and love us. And we'll see you all next week. You little maggot. You are no longer a part of this story. Hey, ass butt.